Welcome to the listeners of Tal Radio English. This is TXO Showtime with your host Akshay. For the thousands of people diagnosed every year with life-threatening blood cancers like leukemia and lymphoma, a cure exists. Over the past 35 years, Be the Match, operated by the National Marrow Donor Program, has managed the most diverse marrow registry in the world. They work every day to save lives. throughout the transplant be the match is a global leader in bone marrow transplantation with focus on research to improve transplant outcomes provide support and resources for patients and partner with a global network our guest today is christine mantilla regional director at the be the match she has served as a leader working with a diverse global teams in developing substantive client relationships and cultivating a strong network across various industries christine is a creative strategic thinker with emotional intelligence as her greatest friends christine welcome to the show proud to have you thank here on the show with us thank you very much i'm so glad to be here great as we begin can you tell us about your role as a regional director at be the match and how you contribute to the organization's mission absolutely so I have the privilege of uh working with our members of the registry. So as a leader in member engagement and enrollment, um it is my team's job to uh help with the public health education of our members and those are individuals who volunteer to be on the blood stem cell and marrow donor registry so that if they do ever come up as a match we can actually contact them and give them the option to be that lifesaver that a patient is searching for when they're in need of a blood stem cell or marrow transplant right and then this is such a very important uh, initiative that be the match has taken but there must be some story behind it we would all want to hear about what's the story of behind starting be the match sure so A lot of folks don't realize that uh, blood cancers and many other blood diseases, as you mentioned, are actually curable um, or treatable in the sense of adding years, even decades, to an individual's life. Um, and so, when a patient is diagnosed with one of these diseases and they need um, a donor, a blood stem cell donor, they only have a 30% chance of matching within their family. So, most patients actually need to turn to a stranger. um who matches them uh matching is done based on HLA type or tissue type not just blood type which is what what makes the registry um so very important and necessary um so they're turning to a stranger to to help them get more time with their family with their loved ones um and to be their cure and that's the very important role that we play is just to be that connector between these patients and those individuals unknown to them that could be anywhere in the world um that can actually be that life-saving match for them right could you explain uh, the importance of uh, the match registry and uh, how it helps in finding matching donors or patients with blood cancers Absolutely. So when uh, as someone becomes a member of the registry, what they're doing is actually providing a buckle swab or a cheek swab. Um that gives us the ability to create a tissue typing profile for that member and that's ultimately what goes into the registry. Um as I mentioned, matching between patients and donors isn't just on blood type even though many times donating is similar to uh blood stem cells is similar to donating plasma or, or platelets it's the same process um but because that match is required we have to take that extra step of actually doing the cheek swab and getting that individual's HLA type on the registry be the match has managed the most diverse marrow registry in the world okay that is very important yes how does yes. diversity impact the chances of finding suitable donors for patients in need that's an excellent question and and it's one of the most important uh aspects of this that we share in our capacity of of um you know member engagement education and ultimately enrollment in the registry and that's that our ethnic heritage plays a very important role in matching we are most likely to match with someone who shares our ethnic heritage and unfortunately many of us with diverse HLA types 
are underrepresented on the registry. And, you know, as we like to say, folks can't be a part of a solution that they don't know exists. So it is our responsibility to be out in the world, to be out in our communities, providing that education so that our community members can make an informed decision about being on the registry and ultimately, if they match, becoming a donor. Um, and so, you know, someone that has um, primarily white heritage might have a 79% chance of finding a match when they need one um, versus someone with black African-American heritage might have a 29% chance. Um, I'm first generation American. My parents are from Peru, so I'm Hispanic Latina and I have less than a 50% chance of finding a match should I need one. Um, so we are working very hard to make sure that every single group is represented and there's no reason that we can't be at 100%. We just need more people to know that this is an option um, and what it means to be a member and potentially a donor um, should they match. And uh, what is Be The Match uh, doing in terms of ensuring that the message goes out to everywhere? What are the steps being taken to ensure that uh, the possibility or probability of finding a match is increased? So in the intro, important aspects about Be The Match were mentioned, but one of the most important um, to us is really our research. So we have a number of clinical trials happening, um, not just in terms of uh, uh, matched or mismatched donor transplantation, but also cord blood, which can be used for transplant. So we're always looking for ways to create um, a, a positive outcome for patients who need a transplant, um, not just with a fully matched donor, but with these other technologies that are also available. And, um, and we're also not just looking for survival, but we're looking for the ability for patients to thrive. Um, so that is an initiative that's very important to us that we work on. But I would say the other one is, um, and this is what my team works on directly, is, as I mentioned, being in our communities and having those interactions um, at local food festivals and on college campuses and through many national partners that we work with, um, sororities, fraternities, medical student associations, and so on, um, so that we can make sure that the information is out there and that we are available face-to-face -face with folks to answer questions about what it means. Um, and so, again, to empower those informed decisions about becoming a member, becoming a donor, supporting financially or any other way um, that folks choose to support our mission, which also includes volunteering, for example. Right. And uh, is the volunteering happens uh, all across uh, uh, the U.S. or does it happen uh, all across the globe? If yes, how do you extend yourself just beyond the boundaries of United States and get to the other countries? How do you bring the whole world together? Such a good question. So we are part of the global cooperating registries. So we have partners across Europe, South America, Asia, um, uh, and Africa that we pool all of our members essentially. So um, when a patient does a search for a match, they have access to over 39 million members across all the cooperating global registries uh, to give them the best possible odds of finding a match. And then we will facilitate bringing those stem cells um, to the patient from anywhere in the world. Um, you mentioned volunteers. We have an incredible group of volunteers um, who are our couriers, and they will hand carry those blood stem cells from the donor to the patient anywhere in the world. Um, so we have many of our volunteer couriers who are just incredible humans that are doing this work for free. Um, and we, you know, of course, pay for their travel and, you know, they may be in Europe in the morning and then be in South America in the afternoon delivering that product. So we really try to make sure that, um, that everything is, is connected for the benefit of the patient. Um, we also have volunteers that are showing up at community events and being part of that public health education um, across all 50 states and also in Mexico where we operate. So um, it's something that's very important to us to make sure that it really is a global community supporting these patients. Right. It's a, it's a huge initiative, right? I mean, it, it must require uh, be the match to connect with a lot of 
blood banks all across the globe. A uh, lot of uh, cooperative organizations or registries that we may talk about. Uh, you got to be going through a lot of standards to adhere to. How is this done? Is there a, a kind of a organization or a network established to achieve it? Yep. So um, Be The Match is an organization of about 1,400 employees and thousands of volunteers that dedicate their time to this effort. Um, and we achieve it by by being organized in a way that serves every one of our audiences. So, you know, I mentioned we serve the members. We have another team that serves our donors. We have another team that exclusively serves our patients' needs. And then we have another team that works with all of our partners, as you mentioned, transplant centers, apheresis centers, blood banks, and so on. Um, so we, we actually do cover all sides of what it takes to facilitate and and have a successful transplant. Um, And we do it through an incredible network of partners um, that help us to achieve that. Yeah. And I guess one other important piece is uh, educating the society, right? In terms of uh, getting involved into this process. How do you enable it? So any individual can join this life-saving movement in one of three ways, they can do it from home. If you are between the ages of 18 and 40, that means that you are eligible to actually be a volunteer member of the registry. And if you match, potentially say yes to being a donor. Um, And you can do that very easily by texting CURE15, C-U-R-E-1-5 to the number 61474. And what we will do is actually send you a a swab kit to your home. So you can sit on your couch, take a few minutes to fill out that digital registration form, do your cheek swab, send it back in completely free of charge. We will type it and add you as a member to the registry. Um, And then if you are to match, we reach out to you. We give you all the information of that donation process Um, and then donation is actually completely free all costs associated with that are covered by us, including things like if you are um, needed to travel, all your travel and accommodations for yourself and a companion, pet care, child care, we'll do anything that we need to do to make sure that that donation is facilitated. The second way that individuals can contribute from home is of course, by making a financial contribution. Um, We have patient assistance programs for folks who are going through a very hard time with their health. And as you know, that can have a very big financial impact for families. Um, So that's a simple thing to do as well that anyone can do and that they can just text GIVE, G-I-V-E, to 61474, make a contribution to our foundation in that way. And the third way folks can help from home is by searching some volunteer opportunities with us and just seeing where we are in their own community. Um, And as I mentioned, you know, we're at community events like uh, food festivals and things like that. We're also on college campuses all across the U.S. and in Mexico. Um, So if people want to take an hour or a few hours, 10 hours, however much time to commit to helping with that public health education, um, they can be a part of the mission in that way as well. Right. And uh, what are some of the challenges uh, that uh, Be The Match faces in terms of uh, increasing donor registration and ensuring a wider donor pool? And how are these challenges addressed? Sure. So there are unfortunately a lot of myths around bone marrow uh, donation and blood stem cell donation um, because of how it may have been represented in the media in the past or things like that. So the main uh, thing that we have to address is just the education around what is donation? What does that look like? What that What is that experience like? And so folks need to know that there are two ways to donate. About 90% of the time, um, it is what we call a peripheral blood stem cell or PBSC donation. So the experience of that, um, you receive a medication for five days before your your donation day, um, which helps to mobilize those blood stem cells in your body. And then you go in, you sit in a big comfy armchair, a line is put in each arm, and that blood comes out, goes into a special machine that spins out just the blood stem cells that are needed for the patient. The rest of that whole blood returns to the donor through the other arm. Um, And then after a few hours, that 
little bag of blood stem cells, which are literally the cure for cancer in many cases, uh, goes with one of our couriers to the patient and the donor immediately can resume all their normal day-to-day activities. Um, and our bodies miraculously replace or regenerate those stem cells that are donated. So there's no loss or impact to the donor. Um, and again, that's the procedure that's done about 90% of the time. And a lot of folks are surprised to hear that, right? Because they may have heard uh, some myths about bone cracking or bone drilling, right? And, and that's not the case at all. Um, and then about 10% of the time, our donors may also be asked if they would be willing to donate marrow. So that is the procedure that happens in an OR, in an operating room. Um, and that's because the donor is under general anesthesia. And the liquid marrow is then drawn from the pelvic bone with a syringe, a uh, specialized syringe. Um, and that is the more concentrated form of marrow that is then sent to the donor. Um, and that's about 10% of the time, again, so it's pretty infrequent, um, but it's still an option that's available depending on what the, doc- the doctor deems is most um, viable for the patient. So that hurdle of education on, you know, what are the two ways to donate? What does that commitment look like? Should I say yes? is the biggest barrier, I would say, for people um, feeling informed enough to actually join the registry. And so we just need uh, time, right? We need time in the form of those personal interactions when we're out in the community, um, things like this, right? Um, Interviews, video content that we share on all of our social media platforms, Um, And actual donors and patients sharing their own stories of not just surviving, but thriving and what it's meant to them to be part of that experience um, in order for for people to to feel informed, empowered, prepared to be a part of the mission in that way. That's a good segue. Uh, You did mention about actual donors sharing their own stories. Uh, You want to share some such inspiring stories of all whole lot that you may be having at their at your end uh, with for for patients who actually found the matching donor through the match and uh, stories both on side of uh, the uh, the donor experience and also the patient's experience sure um you know i've been fortunate to see many first meetings between a patient and their donor Um, a recipient and their donor. And it's something that um, moves me nearly to tears every time because it's such a special relationship that they have and um, just such an incredible thing to think that, um, you know, that you could literally be a lifesaver to a stranger. Um, So I'm happy to to share um, one of them. I was fortunate to to witness a meeting between a a recipient and a donor. The recipient lives in Singapore and the donor lives in Southern California, Um, didn't know each other at all. And the recipient uh, found out that they had one match, one match in the entire world. And when the donor was contacted, um, he was about to get married and they said, okay, you know, this is the timeline that we need to do this transplant for the patient. Can you do it? And so he and his now wife uh, discussed it and made the decision that he would donate. They would postpone their honeymoon and he would do the donation one week after their wedding. So, you know, they went into it with open hearts, but of course, apprehension and questions and um, you know, our, our donor team worked really hard to make sure that they felt comfortable and had all the, the knowledge that they needed. And so he went forward with it. Um, and of course, everything went smoothly. There weren't any complications or anything uh, that went awry. And then those cells at the time, he didn't know it, made their way all the way across the world to Singapore um, to this uh, recipient who, who shared his Pakistani Um, heritage. And so a couple of years later, um, the gentleman from Singapore was actually traveling in the the US and reached out to us and said, hey, you know, it's been more than a year, which is the the amount of time that needs to pass before both the donor and recipient can agree to meet or to have direct communication. 
So he said, you know, it's been more than a year. I'm, I'm going to happen to be in the States for this one day. Is there any chance that you can help us arrange a meeting? And so we all leapt into motion. And um, since I'm based personally in Southern California, I was able to facilitate that meeting myself. Um, and, and we brought them together in the garden of a local hotel um, because that's the venue that we could find on short notice. Um, and it was just amazing to see them embrace each other and to see them um, recognize little similarities in their appearance or their mannerisms in each other, which often happens between recipients and, and their donors. Um, and their sp spouses were there with them as well. And, you know, it's, it's been more than two years now since his, uh, since his transplant took place and they're both thriving and they've, they've, you know, they left that day and went and had dinner at one of their homes and their family now. And that's what happens very often between recipients and, and their donors is that they have this totally unbreakable, totally unique bond for the rest of their lives. Oh my goodness, it moved me. It's a very uh, unforgettable experience, right, for any person in the world. I think giving and sharing on one side is perfectly good gratitude towards what we have but being a part of something a part of giving which is actually giving a life to an individual is very very important it moved it me certainly thank you for sharing the story of course well uh, yep 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 and see uh, all of these what be the mat is doing would not be done without the involvement of medical professionals and uh, healthcare institutions. How are you collaborating with them uh, to facilitate a success? One of the most important initiatives that we're working on right now is really being able to provide 360 support for our community oncologists. So these are oncologists that are serving um, a lot of our less populated areas throughout the country, throughout Mexico, throughout South America, um, maybe in smaller cities, folks who don't see these kinds of diagnoses every day, right? And so um, they may not always know all the treatment options that are actually available to their patient. So by us being there and being in partnership with transplant centers, with community oncologists across, you know, all areas um, of the country, we're able to provide faster tissue typing, more complex tissue typing for the patient. We're able to support a more in-depth diagnosis and analysis of the, the state of the illness and, and what we can do, um, what their treatment options might be. And we're able to move much faster for those patients who do uh, require a transplant because we've done a lot of that tissue typing and, and work in advance. So that facilitates a faster search for a donor if one is needed, um, and it facilitates a, a faster ability to actually get them prepared um, for transplant and get them to their transplant day. Um, so those community partnerships with oncologists, um, you know, across all different um, sizes of hospitals and, and medical institutions is something that's very important to us so that everyone can have equal access to the best possible treatment option for them. And, and for anybody who looks forward to uh, become a part of the organizations, are there kind of any specific prerequisites or the criteria requirements for uh, individuals looking to join the registry as potential donors? Uh, we just ask that folks be between the ages of 18 and 40, um, in general, good health. Uh, so our commitment, of course, is to the patient, but also to the donor. And we want to make sure that there is no potential risk at all to someone becoming a donor. So there are some questions um, about uh, certain health conditions that are asked as part of the, the digital registration form um, so that if there is any potential risk um, to them, we will uh, let them know that, that it's not a good idea for them to be on the registry. Um, 
But other than that, it's just the willingness to say yes, if you're called. And that's very important because a lot of folks may be on the registry for months or years um, before they match, if they ever match. And so when someone does get that call months or three years, or in the case of one of my colleagues, 12 years after joining the registry, um, we have to stay engaged, right? And we have to stay willing to say, yes, I'm being called and I will step up to do this. Um, so just that commitment, right, is something that is important to consider. If you're, if you're thinking of joining the registry, making sure that you're leaning on the side of saying yes, if you do actually uh, get the honor of matching with a patient. Right, and and this is being done for uh, over thirty five years at Be the Match. And uh, how has the organization evolved over time? Um, what are uh, some of the key milestones or achievements that you would want to share with our listeners? Sure. So our organization has grown quite a lot, um, especially in the last five years or so. Um, we have expanded uh, our team, my team, of uh, folks who are actually out actively working in their communities to engage face-to-face -face with people and, and help them make that decision about, about joining the registry. We've also expanded um, significantly our donor search and donor workup team. So that's the, those are the folks that when someone matches, they're the ones making the phone call, the email, the sending a FedEx, they're the ones uh, making sure to get in contact with that person as quickly as possible and actually be their, their guides through that don donor journey. Um, so we're, you know, very interested in providing an excellent experience for everyone who comes along with us on the mission and surrounding them with support, with education and with empowerment. Um, so that's some of the, the biggest growth that we've seen but also one of the most significant milestones, which we've surpassed at this point, um, is 100,000 lives saved, um, which is just hard to even imagine, right? Um, that's such a huge milestone to think 100,000 transplants facilitated by Be The Match um, and, you know, 100,000 families directly impacted by our work. And even through the pandemic, we've continued to exceed our annual number of lives impacted as well. So uh, 2022, we impacted over 7,000 patients and their families who get a second chance at life. And we're looking at beating that number again this year. So we're always striving to do more uh, and serve as many families as possible. Right. And uh, does Be The Match also uh, very actively get involved in any research uh, or advancements in the field of uh, cell transplantation? Or do you basically provide the supporting role? Uh, where do you get involved in this process? So we actually operate the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transplant Research. Uh, so the CIBMTR is how we refer to it. Um, but it is uh, a collaborative resource uh, for research in cellular therapies, specifically with the intention of improving patient outcomes. So again, not just allowing patients to survive and, and beat their diagnosis, but to actually thrive post-treatment. Um, so we have many initiatives that we are investing in um, and championing it with that in mind. Um, and so for anyone that's interested in, in looking into more of our medical research, um, all that information is available online at cibmtr.org. All right. And uh, I know you touched upon this, uh, but I would still want to try and understand as to if somebody would want to come forward, right, in terms mm -hmm. of... Uh, not just being a part of the registry or somebody might feel, okay, you know what, let me get associated with some kind of a donation on the financial side of it. What are the yes. ways and means yes. that they can get associated with the organization? So if they want to support financially um, as an individual contributor, as I mentioned, they can text GIVE to 61474. Um, but we also work with a lot of corporate giving programs. We partner with ERGs, employee resource groups um, at companies of many different sizes all across the country. We work 
on a larger scale with, um, for example, the Pomeroy Foundation that funds a lot of our work in the Black and African American community. Um, so we're we're always open um, to looking at those partnerships and and the Be the Match Foundation that handles all of our fundraising um, is really the the best resource for that. So. Um, yeah, if someone wants to be an individual contributor, they can do that as a one-time thing or on a monthly basis. Um, but we're, you know, we also work with uh, with larger partnerships for grants and funding um, for specific programs. Uh, another area where we've recently made some significant investments is with our AANHPI, so Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Member Enrollment Program, which is another underserved or underrepresented, I should say, group on the registry. Um, so we have many focused efforts and, um, and folks who are wanting to contribute to the mission financially um, would be able to, to kind of choose what moves them, right? What is on their heart that they want to invest in and, and the type of work that they want to support. Right. And one last question. If you would want to pass on a message to the listeners uh, of this episode, what would that be? I think it's so important for us to take the time to learn about uh, what it means to be a member, to be a donor, to be a financial supporter, um, because there are people out there just like us that are counting on us. And even though they may be strangers to us now, um, you just never know the impact that you can have. And, and it's the power of one, right? The power of one individual is incredible. And that's something that, you know, a lot of times we may think, well, what can I do or what impact could I really have? Um, and every single person matters. Every single member matters. Every single donation matters. So there's nothing too small that you can do um, to really, you know, change somebody's life. Thank you very much, uh, Christine. I do take your statement. There is nothing so small that you can do to save somebody's life. That's a very, very uh, a touching statement. Uh, I think let's wrap it up with that statement for our listeners so that they could carry these thoughts with them and do something about it. Everybody Sounds matters. Good. Every life matters. Absolutely. Thank you very much for all the work that you're doing. And it's been a great pleasure to chat with you. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.